chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to continue Satan's Bargains. Let me just recap just a little bit what we discovered in the first half of this lecture, uh, this set of lectures, was that Satan will even use your love for Christ, such as he did Peter when he announced to the disciples, we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be in the tomb three days, and then uh, we'll resurrect. And Peter, no way, Lord, we're going to get swords and an army and we're going to save you. Well, you see, had, had Peter's love allowed him, where would you be or I be today without the salvation of that crucifixion, that tomb, and the resurrection. We, we would all be lost, so God's plan is the way. And Christ looked at him and said, Get behind me, Satan. Because Satan had bargained with Peter's very love. So you've got to be a discerner, if you would, and naturally having knowledge of our Father's word and his wisdom enables and uh, matures one, and understand the word matures one, into discernment. Discernment is not something you just wake up with necessarily. It can be a gift. But usually your unction of God's Word after coming to the knowledge of it, you are able to discern that that doesn't mesh with our Father's Word and you automatically cast it out because it doesn't belong. You reject it as false teaching or traditions. And that comes from hearing the Word of God with understanding. We discussed a, um, a couple of those bargains. It is written even in the second chapter of the third book of, of, of the, uh, rather the second chapter of Second Peter, that even the angels who are uh, have a better mental understanding than we do, not even they argue with Satan. So never take the time to argue with him. But today we're going to talk about, well first, let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. And I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 6 to verse 13. I want to cover that verse with you before we start in this particular lecture. And that particular verse is from what is known by many people is the Lord's Prayer. And there's one point in there that is very important in that 13th verse. And let's read it. And it reads at this time, Matthew 6, verse 13, And lead us not into temptation. That means into turmoil. Now our Father does guide, but He will allow you to be tempted if you so choose, but He will not lead you. All right, but deliver us from evil. This word evil is phoneros in the Greek, and it means the devil. It means uh, hateful. It means the hurtful, rather, the evil one, meaning Satan. Deliver us from Satan and his bargains. All right, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In other words, our Father's is the kingdom, not Satan's power on this earth, whereby he has the supernatural ability through evil spirits to pass himself off as the Holy Spirit if you do not discern. Something you want to be ready for, my friend, because there will be a day when Christ, when many think they have followed him, will tell them, I never knew you. Out of my sight. Get away from me. So it is important that you have that discernment, that you grow mature in our Father's Word. The greatest temptation of all times, the, one of the greatest bargains of all times is approaching. And if I were not to teach it, to warn, then certainly it would be a shortcoming on my part. Because we, in this generation that is now living, 
will certainly go through that temptation, through that deception, and I'll lay a little bit of groundwork for it by simply saying Christ was asked in Matthew 24. You have a replay of it in Mark 13 as well as Luke 21. He was asked, what's it going to be like at the end of this earth age when you return, when your second coming comes to pass? And he gave those seven things. The warning was not that maybe Antichrist would come, but that the Antichrist in fact would come. And it, he would appear before there was any gathering back to the true Christ. Unfortunately, if, if Satan is successful in arranging in the minds and hearts of people the thought that they're going to escape all that when the actual seven signs and seals tell the Christian, which is to say God's elect, the church, what they're supposed to be doing during that time. They're not off somewhere spinning around on a star but they are here working in the field. And of course, the first one that is taken is taken by that false Messiah. Many people say, well, I wonder, I just can't find my niche. I don't know what it is that I am to do to the, for the Father. Well, have you never read Mark 13? God is calling out a people that will not be deceived, that will escape that evil one. Why? Because in their mind is the knowledge of God and there isn't room enough in their minds for a bunch of lies put forth by Satan in the form of bargains. It is written in that great book of Daniel that when this false one, this evil one, this false Christ or instead of Jesus appears that he does not come in as you think of the devil with a pitchfork and the horns and and so forth, but he comes in peacefully and prosperously. Let me ask you something. You want to hear a bargain? How would you feel in, in as much as you have been conditioned to say, there's going to be another crash like there was in the year 29. There's going to be a recession. Everything is going to fall. Everything is going down when in fact, the false one appears prosperously and peacefully. What kind of bargain is this? He says, hey, I'll pay all your bills for you and just ride off that house, all those payments. It's yours, friend. It's yours because you love me. Do you remember when he said to Jesus, if you'll worship me, I'll give you the whole world? Most people would sell out for just their own property, you know, not knowing, of course, thinking it was the true Christ because the doomsdayers have always taught that doom and gloom concerning Satan and they paint the wrong picture of his appearance as instead of Christ or the false Messiah. Therefore, they're going to believe in fact that he is the true Christ come to gather them together and give them a one-way ticket out of here they'll believe it because he won't have the horns. You know, he was the most beautiful of all the archangels, the most cunning, subtle speaker that ever walked the earth. He was good enough even in the world, first earth age, what, the, the thing that started all this, that he pulled the hearts and minds and love of one third of God's children away from him. That's pretty sharp, my friend. That's a very convincing speaker, leader, that is able to do that. Well, he's coming back again. Many will wonder, well, exactly how do we meet with the true Christ and where will these events flow that God spoke of in that 24th chapter of Matthew and the 13th chapter of Mark, as though that they were not in the simplicity in which Christ taught understandable on their own, especially when you 
get your second witness from the book of Revelation and pick up the seven seals, which are identical, an overlay of those events that Christ uh, related that consummate the end of this age. For this particular bargain of Satan's, I'm going to take you to the second, to second Thessalonians. I'm going to take you to the second chapter where Paul gives us a capsule, but a very specific, detailed report of how Christ shall gather back to us and we shall gather to him. Now, you have a choice, my friend. You can believe the traditions of men, such as 1 Thessalonians, you have many church systems that mistranslate the fourth chapter of that first book of Thessalonians so badly that they have people believing they're going to rapture out. It just isn't there in the Greek. The subject is concerning the dead. And Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen are in that particular thing. But many people misunderstood that first letter that Paul wrote to the, to the Thessalonians. So he hastily writes the second. Why do I say hastily? Because, because uh, uh, Sil, uh, Silas and Timothy are still there. Okay. With that thought in mind, Paul writes the second letter, and it's a very stern warning. Chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians, verse 1, and it reads, Now we beseech ye, brethren, you brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our, I repeat, our gathering together unto him. Now, I don't know how that could be made any plainer to you. What Paul has said here, I want to talk to you about Christ's return and our gathering back together with him. Now, let me ask you a question. What have you been told? Oh, we're going to be driving along in an automobile and Zippo, just like the old Zippo works. We're out of here, man. It's like pushing the eject button and we're sailing out into the blue with our white robes on and we're flapping our wings and we're making headway, all right? That's what the church says. Do you want to know what God says about it through this apostle Paul? Who are you going to believe, my friend? God's word or traditions of men? I don't know. It's up to you. Paul's going to tell you, I'm sure, according to your church system, pretty soon here he's going to say, we're going to fly away. Well, let's see what Paul says and let Paul speak for himself. Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. In other words, I don't want anyone to deceive you on this point, and I don't want you to be troubled about it. Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by a letter from us, like that First Thessalonian letter, chapter 4, as that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, I'm going to tell you exactly how it's going to be. And don't you let somebody else fool you with any flyaway doctrine or anything else. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, I repeat, not come, except there come a falling away first. That's the apostasy. In other words, there is no way that Christ will return to this earth until after the great apostasy. Well, what's the great apostasy? Well, let's read on and I'll explain it to you. And that man of sin revealed the son of perdition. There is a lot of discussion on who is the son of perdition. Can, do you have a strong concordance? Can't you go to the Greek and check it out? It is the son that has already been judged to perish. That's what perdition means in the Greek tongue. Well, that really takes a lot of the load off your mind, you know, because if you have a mind, it isn't too difficult if you're familiar at all with God's Word to know that there is only one that has already been judged to perish. And that is the Son. 
that has been sentenced to death by fire from within in Ezekiel chapter 28, that's to say Satan himself. And as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, Michael the archangel shall cast Satan out onto this earth, and they rejoice in heaven. But then there are three woes, woe, woe, woe to you on earth. For Satan is down on, with you, and he and his angels, and he knows he has but a short time. All right? He's coming. Well, I wonder what he's going to do when he gets here. Exactly what the false Christ has been reported by Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Those deeds shall be accomplished. He will come in prosperously and peacefully, claiming to be the Savior of the world, Messiah. And unfortunately, all the world will wonder after him and his checkbook, his promises, his bargains, the greatest bargain of all time. How about you? How are you fixed for blades, friend? How are you fixed for knowledge? Verse 4, this is what he does. Who? Who is this who? The son of perdition. Who is the son of perdition? Now, let's not be thick. There's only one. Don't ever let some ship-shod would-be preacher tell you it is Judas, because Judas has not been sentenced to death. He will be judged on the judgment day, then we'll know. But he is never called the son of perdition only by misunderstanding by certain would-be teacher preachers. Who? The devil, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God while he's here on earth, when he's cast out here, when he appears. At the, and this is what brings about the apostasy, which is to say a large group of people changing their alliance in one moment. Meaning why? They're deceived. So they think this is Jesus. And they follow him. Because he claims to be God, the whole Godhead, Christ, all wrapped into one. Or that is worship so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. God. In other words, showing himself to the world through our present uh, high tech. Uh, you can shoot a picture around the world in an instant. We push one button here and, and uh, my image goes over this entire hemisphere in just an instant. He will show the world that the Savior has returned. And most of the world is not expecting that. Come to take you away. Come to gather you back to me. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. In other words, it was something that was discussed a great deal when they sit around the dinner table, when they sit around a campfire, when they were simply visiting. This was a discussion. Why? It's the most important point, our gathering back to the Lord Jesus Christ. How does it happen? He's telling you. Now, who are you going to listen to? Paul in the Word of God or man? It's a big bargain, friend. How much will it take to buy you? Who can buy you? Can a church system that calls itself a church and yet teaches traditions of men buy your mind? It's really strange because sometimes they don't even buy it. You pay for their deception. It is not that they do it with knowledge. It is because they are ignorant of God's Word. And the word ignorant is not a bad word. It simply means they are not and do not have eyes to see or ears to hear to understand the true Word of God. Therefore, just as Paul, the writer of this book, before his conversion on the road to Damascus, misled. He was a zealous follower of the living God, and he killed Christians. Well, many Christians that think they are called and misteach will have a tough time. But they do it in love or 
it's really a kind thing to say in ignorance because where there is ignorance, there is no sin necessarily. They don't know what they're doing. All right, verse 6. And now you know. We talked about all this, but now you have it in your mind. What withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Now the English reader has a great deal of confusion with this because within the Greek itself, the verb is transitive. It does not follow through in the English translation. A transitive verb is a verb that letteth, in other words, that must draw power, the, that is to say the subject and the object, from that that was being discussed before this verse came into the picture. Do you understand what I'm saying? The verb letteth, only he will let until he be taken out of the way, goes back to the subject and the object that's being discussed before this particular action, the verb, came in front of the eye. Well, what were we talking about? It's real easy transfer the action back to the subject and the object. What was the subject and object? Satan sitting on the temple floor claiming to be God, claiming to be Christ. So naturally the he is he that holds Satan in his place at this time until he's ready to cast Satan down to this earth and let these, this deception take place. Let this supreme bargain of all times take place. One of the tests of the true Christian, will they sell out or have they studied, have they read the simplicity that our Father's Word comes forth with the power of the kingdom and those that have an inheritance awaiting them, will they hold on or will they fall for Satan's bargain and go to hell? Hmm? It all is done, my friend, in a very peaceful, loving way. Don't get caught up. Now, only he led us till he be taken out of the way. What are we talking about? Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. It stipulates there very clearly and in detail and in the simplicity again in which Christ taught. Michael and his angel shall cast Satan and his angels out onto this earth and Satan will have a five-month reign, as it is reiterated in Romans, uh, Revelation 9, to deceive this world into thinking that he is the Messiah. That is the seven-year period shortened down to a five-month reign, even recorded as the time of the locust, letting you know that the locust in that particular larva, that particular um, segment, is May through September. When you go to God's own creation and nature to understand, and those that locust army is the same locust army that comes out of the pit. They're not actually locusts, they're men. Deceived people and fallen angels, Nafa. You're warned of them. You know what happened on Pentecost Day? They spoke in a tongue that every ear that heard that voice understood it in his own language, even in the county in which he was born, the dialect that was spoken there in his own language, all coming out of the same mouth. That's the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit for that particular gift. Peter said, this is that that Joel was talking about. What was Joel talking about? The locust army. God's locust army. God controls that army. You don't have to be afraid of it. God also gives you power over all your enemies. So, Michael is he that holdeth and letteth, and Satan is the subject that is cast out here claiming to be Jesus. Is that difficult? I think not. I think it's a, it's a very, very easy verse to understand. Verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Do you know who the Kenites are? Well, within its own, it's working. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken 
out of the way. And there we have, and there we have the lettuce, the transitive verb that carries it back to Lucifer. Verse 8, and then, what happens then? Then shall that wicked be revealed. Who? The lawless one. Satan, the son of perdition whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What comes out of the Lord's mouth? His tongue. What does that symbolize? His word. You're a part of that word. If you understand it, if you have the wisdom assembled in your mind, then you have the seal of God in your forehead as it is reiterated in Revelation chapter 9, and Satan cannot touch you. You are immune from the and escape the hour of temptation, not by flitting off like a firefly, but by staying in the field and working with the gospel armor on and in place, standing against the fiery darts of this Satan. Satan, Satan will fall. He's going to lose. Will you go for his bargain, friend? The mystery doth already work, unfortunately. The deception is spread wide and far since the year 1830 concerning the so-called gathering back to Christ according to not God's word but man's churchosity. Well, does that mean that you know everything? No, but I know how to read my Father's Word with understanding. And anything that doesn't agree with that, I don't care who it is or where they're from, they're wrong, my friend. And my Father's Word is accurate to the point, to the minute. Then with his word from his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. What has Paul said here? Christ will not return to this earth until after the son of perdition has his little segment of time as brought forth in Revelation chapter 9. And it shall run its full course. And there shall be much deception and much bargain hunting on that day. Hey, you like a good sale, friend? There's going to be a fire sale out that time. It's going to be wonderful. Come, let us stamp your bills all paid in full. Here, have plenty. Just receive and worship me. Believe that I am him in your forehead. That is the mark of the beast, in your forehead, not something printed out here on front that you're deceived and went for a bargain. Wake up. You have something in your forehead. Use it. Use it to the point that regardless of what man, this man or any other man might say, that you have the intelligence God-given to go to his word and listen to him without the outside influence that might be perpetrated, traded, through the traditions of men. Be careful, my friend. The bargains are a glore. There are plenty of them. And those bargains are ready to be snapped up by those. Do you know why many people will go for it? Well, let's read on and find out. Let's go to the next verse, okay? And it would be the verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. For every negative there is a positive. Who are we talking about? The office of false messiah that the dragon himself brings forth. The dragon Satan also. Have you never read uh, Revelation chapter 20, that old dragon, the serpent, which is to say the devil? Same entity. But that office is destroyed with the brightness of the coming of Christ. and. Satan will be cast into the abyss for the thousand-year period of the millennium. But he will never be able to use the, the role or the office of false Jesus again. What is this with all power and signs and lying wonders? He's a good salesman, friend. And there are many going to fall for it because of false teachings whether it's false teaching and ignorance or what, it all has the same answer. Deception, false bargain, big deal, quick sale. I'm out of here, all right? 
That's where you will be if you do not study your Father's Word and have discernment to understand the simplicity in which God's Word is written that a child can understand. If you will take your time and listen to the Word of God rather than what some man might say. Verse 10, stay sharp. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, perdition, the son of perdition, the devil in Revelation, I'm sorry, in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 18, that is already sentenced to death, fire from within, perish utterly because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. What is the love of the truth? This is the truth. Have you learned to love it or do you like to listen to shade tree mechanics in the spiritual line? Just give me a hammer. I can teach you God's word in just a minute. I can have that old buggy running like a new one. Listen to your father's word. You're intelligent enough to read it for yourself most, and otherwise that's why God sends gifted teachers to teach the word, to help you in it. Whereby, But make certain that it is not the teacher that you follow, but the word in which he teaches with the gift of the Holy Spirit, that that spirit automatically transfers that knowledge from that mind to the other. That's what the word masara in the Hebrew means. It has a, a meaning even more so than that. It means to transfer it without change, without changing one iota. They would not learn to love the Word of God. Do you love reading the Word of God? Well, I've always found it a little, you know, because you don't understand, beloved. If you understood, you would love the Word because it is exciting. It is vivacious. God is calling out the champions of his people into action, not to sit in some pew and, and grow corns on your feet, but to understand his word and be active within that. Now verse 11, stay sharp. And for this cause, God, who? The son of perdition? The devil? No, no, God. For this cause, what cause? Don't be sharp-minded on me. The cause of not loving God's word, not loving the truth. God shall send them strong delusion, a big bargain, friend, and they, that they should believe a lie. Whose lie? Satan's lies. His big bargain. The fact that he's sitting there in Jerusalem in the temple of God, claiming to be God and the son thereof, Savior of the world, follow me, pay all your debts. I'm not just saying those things. They can be documented in the book of Daniel that he comes in prosperously and peacefully. That is one reason I can tell you there will never be another world crash. You may have a little bit of a slowdown, but there will never be another crash. The checkbook is well in hand. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. What is the truth? Some church system? Well, if, it's, if it holds fast to God's Word and teaches it chapter by chapter and line by line, rather than some windbag blowing off steam for an hour with one verse Charlie going on his mind. I'm not, uh, that I, e evangelists are immune from that statement. Who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness, actually enjoyed being taken advantage of, actually enjoyed the lie, actually enjoyed having their house payments made and everything handed out on a silver platter because they worshiped him when he said, I am Jesus. You see, Antichrist being proper, the English mind automatically thinks that's against Christ. Not so, friend. The Greek correct translation is instead of Christ. That's important. Instead of Christ. Hey, he claims to be Christ and he claims everything about Christ is good. There's just one problem. He claims to be Christ when he is in fact the son of perdition. 
Was that difficult to follow? That, my friend, will be the big sale. It is Satan's last dance, except for a very short season at the end of the millennium. A very short dance. Well, was Paul alone? Was Paul alone in teaching this? Oh, no, my friend. You live in a generation that much of this is already coming to pass. Let's go to the teachings of Christ in Revelation chapter 13 for a moment. In the 13th chapter of Revelations, which is covered very adequately in the free tape that we give away here called the Mark of the Beast. So, therefore, I will skip the first beast. There are two beasts mentioned in this book of Revelation. The first beast, which is a multi-headed, which God does not deal in fictitious characters, but it means it is a political system. It's called, in your generation, the New World Order. NAFTA, just having been passed, was the first big step, one of the first big steps into the New World Order, or moving you into that religious system, that re political system, rather, that receives a deadly wound. How does a political system receive a deadly wound? It doesn't quite get to the surface. You have GATT going. You have many world agreements um, uh, throughout the world trying to pull together. The Europe itself at this time, with the exception of one country, is all set to have just one visa, one money for all the nations. <laughs> New World Order, my friend, it's and it's a freight train, an express that's coming down the main line, and they're barely putting the brakes on for the curves. It's speeding ahead. The deception. But what I want you to know is after it receives that deadly wound, the dragon himself in verse 4 will heal that wound. This is what appears on the scene. See if you can relate it to those scriptures, the big bargain that we just covered in Paul, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay, Revelation 13 and verse 11. Listen very carefully. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. In other words, he was on the earth, and it was built up out of the earth. He's actually cast out of heaven. But he's a snake belly crawling in the dust. He'll always be there as far as degradation is concerned. This is another beast. It's the second one. In other words, the first was political. This one is religious. Well, what do you mean religious? Have you already forgotten what the son of perdition claims to be when he sits in the house and temple of God? Religious, of course. Now listen. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. He looked like the lamb slain. He looked like the lamb of God, meaning he looked like Jesus. And he spake as a dragon, not the tongue of God that comes from Christ's mouth uh, and destroys this wicked one. But his tongue, his voice is the dragon's voice. Why? Because he is the dragon, which is to say that old serpent, which is to say the son of perdition, which is to say Satan, my friend. Verse 12, what does he do? He exerciseth all the power of the first before him, that one world political system, fair trade everywhere, hey, big bucks rolling out all over, all right? And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, that's to say the, the world under the Savior. I'm not talking about our true Savior now. Stay with me. Whose deadly wound was healed. I mean, naturally, if you have a supernatural entity showing signs and miracles on this earth and uh, before people, don't worry. They go nuts over a rock star anymore. They're going to eat it up, my friend. The big bargain, special sale today, my friend, a free passage out of here with all bills paid and a happy life in the eternity of Satan's little love bed. Ready to jump in? Verse 13, and he doeth great wonders. This is how he deceives people. 
so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight. I repeat, sight. You're going to see it of men. In other words, he is able to perform miracles, really snap his fingers, make lightning strike the earth. Hey, you can get a bunch, you can gather quite a crowd with a little miracle like that. Show us again. Do it again. Oh, great master. Okay? But some of his wonders... Are, is in controlling the one world system whereby peace has come. He, remember, he comes in prosperously and peacefully and many are deceived. This will happen before Jesus Christ gathers anyone unto him, self. Verse 14 to complete. What does he do? Big bargain hunter, watch out, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power, not maybe, he had power to do in the sight of the beast, in other words, Satan himself, the religious system, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, the one world system and its religious leader, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And you all know what follows that. He would cause all those to worship him and he would give them everything if you'll just, if you'll just worship me. It's up to you, friend. Who do you worship? First commandment. You will put no other God before the living God, your father or his son. Bargain days ahead, my friend. You see, it's too late to play church, my friend. Christianity is a reality. And the flip side of the coin of Christianity is anti-Christianity. It also flourishes at this time. The false one. The great spiritual leader will be very convincing. Those that have the seal of God, I want you to make a home assignment. Revelation chapter 9, I believe it's verse 4. Satan is told, you don't dare touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. You can go down and sting the others like a scorpion. Don't kill them because Satan doesn't have that power. But buy them with your miracles. But he cannot touch one of God's elect. Do you know why? We know who he is. There is no way, no bargain big enough to cause me. I would come near calling him what he actually is and telling him where he's going to go. But we are not to premeditate what we will say to him, but speak that that was spoken on Pentecost Day whereby all languages around the world will hear the voice of Christ through those people that he's calling. Hey, do you have a destiny? Have you known since you were a child there was more to God's word than you had been taught? It's very possible that that's true. Is God speaking to your heart? Think about it. Pray about it. All right, bless your heart. Satan's bargains, don't fall for them. The only bargain there is is eternal life that was paid for by the blood on the cross. Love him, take him into yourself, and you will also enter him, and there will be no deception. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? Some of our works from the